Okay, um, so I want to welcome everyone to this month's uh, meeting of the Houston Functional Programming Users Group. Um, and before we get into our talk today, um, we have uh, Blanca Gonzalez from Microsoft um, here to uh, talk about the Teals program. So Blanca, this is your time. Um, okay, thank you so much. Um, hello everyone, if you just joined- uh, stand up. Oh yeah, Does do that. Does that suit better, yeah. There we go. Okay, great, yeah, I'm kind of short. <laughs> and look, that's the camera right here, okay. Uh, so hi everyone. Uh, if you joined, you know, if you just joined, I'm Blanca Gonzalez. Uh, I am a former computer science teacher, uh, and I uh, have been out of the classroom for a year. I now run the Teals program for Microsoft here in Houston. Uh, and what the what the Teals program is is we pair industry professionals, people such as yourselves, with high school computer science classrooms. We want to make sure that students that are learning computer science get a chance to meet and interact uh, and learn from people that are in the industry. Uh, as a former computer science teacher, I can tell you that no matter how many times I told my students that learning computer science is something worth their while, uh, it never clicked in their head until they met someone um, that was, you know, from, you know, improving or, or from Microsoft. Um, and it can be anyone from it, from any, you know, IT department uh, to come into the classroom and tell them, hey, you know, you're learning, you know, conditionals, you're learning loops. This is stuff that I do at my job every day. It actually is something that you will work with. So uh, what you're learning is definitely worth your time. So um, if you know anyone that likes to work with students, uh, if you uh, would like to give back, um, you know, it's uh, twice a week for about 45 minutes at a time and it's before work hours, between the hours of 7 a.m. and 9 a.m. Uh, and you can do remote or you can, you can come in person to the classroom and make the difference uh, in the student's life. So yeah, that's, that's all I have for today. Uh, if you would like to contact me, um, I've given Claude my contact information. Um, uh, you know, ask me any questions. I'm I'm here to to answer. You know, anything that you know you'd like to ask me about. So I'll I'll post your contact info on our website okay. um, when we post the video. Sounds good. Thank you. Thank you so much for your time, everyone. It was great meeting you all. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So um, today I want to uh, welcome uh, Jonah Beckford um to uh the group um as you all know i uh use ocaml myself um a number of years ago at this point at least from my perspective jonah sort of exploded onto the ocaml scene um one of the things with ocaml is um it, it's it's always been very uh unix centered and its windows story is uh not great the core okay well works fine but the environment the ecosystem is not very windows friendly there there are some problems with the core okay well as well and um jonas sort of came on and he had a post he's like um, i fixed this and um since then um his participation in in the community he's one of the people that when he speaks i listen and um, I don't think we actually interact that much online because he's doing stuff far more sophisticated than I am. Um, but um, yeah, he's one of the people that I'm always going to pay attention to. Um, he's super nice, super kind, and but also just incredibly clear um, when he's either asking questions or uh, giving answers or providing advice or whatever it is. Um, he's a huge member of the community right now. Um, and so I'm really excited to have him here. Um, I'm excited, as I mentioned, that uh, we're, we're both on the uh, program committee for the OCaml users and developers group attached to ICFP, the International Conference for Functional Programming this year. And it'll be in Seattle. He's in Seattle. I'm planning on going to Seattle. So we'll actually be able to hang out in person. Um, and I'm looking forward to working with you. So um, now it's, I'm going to turn it over to you, Jonah. Okay. Well, I thank you for that, uh, that intro introduction that um hope I can live up to uh, at least a, a third of that. 
Um, okay, so let me, um, so yeah, I'm Jonah. Um, and I'm gonna kind of give a, a, um, a story about what I've done over with OCaml. Um, I'm gonna be using a narrative arc. And that actually means that I'm going to go through acts as if I'm writing a story. Um, so my first act, I'm going to be coming along and setting the scenes. I'll be introducing sort of myself and uh, the company that I started, uh, basically answering the question, why am I even talking about camel? Why did I? Why do I even? Why did I even use it? Um, but all good act ones have start sort of um, introducing some some conflict, and uh, you're going to see that in the beginning of act one. And then act two, we're going to see the conflict really, really um, um, blossom. And uh, it, you'll, 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 you'll get hear about how um, OCaml and Windows, um, how I had a lot of challenges with it, um, what got solved there, and how it grew and changed in response to that. And then finally, all good books, they have this act three, happily ever after. I will come along and give a sort of a broad view of the status of o OCaml status of what I'm doing over on Windows. Give a couple brief demos, but that's not really the, 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 point of all, the point of all this. And then finally, what remains? So why don't we start out with that? Um, let's go into act one right now. And um, setting the scene is me. So we're in a functional um, um, users group. And what functional backgrounds did I have um, when I started out with OCaml? Not much. Uh, 20 years ago, I happened to um, work very briefly on the Windows side of Chicken Scheme. Um, and I don't know how many people are familiar with that, but uh, I, I happen okay. to. Chicken Scheme, hell yeah, sorry. I'm sorry, did you hear that? Oh yeah, no, no, I'm saying yes, I remember Chicken Scheme. Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, so yeah, I, I, I briefly worked on the Windows side um, and also the, the swig side. I think that's still actually around the, uh, the oh. interface to see. Um, but that was very brief and that was it 20 years ago. And um, all the languages that have sort of used since have just been the sort of dominant languages. So um, in the, in the uh, 2000s, I was predominantly in the fraud and the credit uh, analytics industries. So dealt with lots of data, um, lots of security with that data because it's credit and fraud. Um, a lot of um, machine learning. Um, the, the customers I generally work with, telecom companies, credit cards, um, issuers, health insurance, those sort of um, um, the big people who need uh, the fraud and the credit. And my environments were C and Java um, in terms of the programming languages and then backend stuff, Unix, right? Solaris, um, IBM, uh, Linux. And I only use Windows for GUIs. And one of the things that you're gonna, you're gonna hear through this is, well, you're distributing um, OCaml on Windows. I'm not a Windows expert. Um, well, I'll explain about why I actually ended up going and, and doing, um, doing Windows, but I am absolutely not a Windows expert. And then in the, actually before the uh, 2010s, I joined, I joined Amazon. Um, I uh, sort of worked sort of in the same kind of areas. I did fraud. I did data warehousing, sort of the data background, and it ended up going over to computer vision. That was sort of a natural um, segue from uh, machine learning. Um, I ended up as um, a principal engineer over there in the in the uh, Amazon Go um, department. Um, if Amazon Go is the, the just walk out store. So heavy CV um, slash AI. And again, it was a lot of data, a lot of security and a lot of machine learning and now some deep learning. Um, my programming uh, environments back then, Java, C, uh, JavaScript slash TypeScript and Python. Um, and just like probably most people, um, the transition happened from Unix over to Linux and I followed as well. So Linux servers, and even in the embedded hardware you do for uh, computer vision, um, it was Linux. Um, so 
I had even less windows um, and, and uh, that, that, that I had before. Uh, I'm still doing windows, but it, it, was, it wasn't as much as I had before. Um, I think right now is a sort of a natural time is I'm just going to comment that anytime that I say something, I go too fast, just put up your hand, raise a question. I'll go, I'll go answer it. Um, unless it's like a really long question, then I will, I will punt it towards the, the end of the, uh, the, uh, talk. So in 2020, um, I had been, uh, over at Amazon for, uh, 12 years. Um, but I decided to actually leave Amazon shortly after um, the George Floyd's incidents over here. Um, and I started a company called Discov. I wanted to take the things that I had from my background. Um, I had basically spent 20 years doing data security and computer vision. And I wanted to um, make a suite of personal safety products um, that combine both hardware and software. And one of the things I sort of identified really quickly as I was kind of going through some of the designs of the products, which I haven't released yet, by the way, um, was that I needed to have um, um, some way for people to communicate with each other and, and it having a lot of requirements that I couldn't find out, uh, readily available out in the, uh, the industry, whether open source or commercial. So the first product that I, I, I really um, um, decided to build was chat. Um, my version of chat, but chat. And I started out by um, forking Signal, um, the, the Signal Messenger. And um, I, so I, I forked the, the front end and the back end. So I had my own back end servers. And I ran into some problems. Um, one of the, one of the, the, the major ones that, that I, I found when I was, when I was uh, forking Signal was they had no server code. Um, they decided not to release any server code for over a year while they were they were um, trying to not reveal that they were developing a cryptocurrency mobile coin into, into their into their application. So um, um, I worked around that. And one of the lessons, though, that I got out of that was if I'm going to come along and ever do something called open source, I have to make sure that it's not just release code and infrequently um, go and maintain it actually make sure it's actually runnable by, by users and maintain it as well. Also, after that, um, um, I, uh, they had the, the Signal app um, has a high velocity of change. So I was forking it, and they had a high velocity of change. And it was really, really difficult at first to um, keep my fork in line with the uh, with the um, the changes that Signal was actually doing, so I ended up developing some tools over in Python. Um, OCaml was not even a part of the vision yet, and um, to maintain my code um, in line with a, a the the um, uh, the stream of changes coming uh, in from Signal, and I got another lesson out of that, which is if I'm going to go do something. Um, I need to make sure that I don't have to go do this again. I don't want to have forking. Forking is just way too high cost, especially um, at that point. I was by myself um, in my in in Discov. So um, you're going to see that sort of later on as I as I kind of start talking about some of the Windows uh, tooling that I do I, I did with OCaml. And finally, and this is a big one. I'm going to spend a little bit more time about this. Um, that front end code, the, the actual app itself, was very lock heavy. Lock Mutex, um, um, it's a, it was a Android, which is what I actually started out with. So it was Java slash Kotlin code. Um, very, very lock heavy. And actually, that caused messages to be lost in ways that were weird. So I'm going to kind of show a little bit about what, what, what I mean. Uh, one of the bug reports that I had actually filed over with was Signal. Um, was based was was saying that um, I'd send out a message, and it took an hour for it to be received um, by other people. And other people were reporting the same things, but um, what you can do to get around it was just go and put your application in the background, put it back in the foreground, and oh, pops a message. If you hadn't done that, then you don't see any message. Um, and as I'm alluding to the central causes for all these is, is locking. 
And uh, so what you do on your phone is you'd have somebody go and um, register their phone over with Signal. And um, once they've registered, they go send a message. After that, um, the other person goes and accepts, hey, this is a new person. Uh, they reply a message back to you. And then you just wait. Um, you wait for hours. And um, um, the message just, just doesn't come through unless you come along and you flip your app, your app in the background and back to the foreground or you close it. Um, and there's a cute little picture of a dog. You have to have a obligatory picture of a dog. Um, waiting for um, some response from from uh, their beloved owner. And uh, where did that go? I'm missing something here. Oh, so the question that like I was building a fork of this, and I was asking myself, like, how do you actually know that you're not getting your messages? Um, you could be out in the field actually having to support this. Um, you 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 go and, and release this to the public, and you have no idea that people are losing their messages. Um, and and um, yeah, so that that was sort of my central question. And I ended up actually doing a, a little hacky solution to it. It's it's if you're familiar with Java at all, you know, you're going to understand what I'm doing here. I'm just notifying um, the the monitor uh, locks um, that. Um, they should unpause themselves. So it ended up being a five-line hacky solution to a really, really broad problem over in the uh, Signal application. And that hides the complexity of how hard it was just to deal with locking issues in that one um, application. So just I'll, I'll just briefly go, go, go on, uh, on this. Um, so this is sort of like the normal code that they had. Um, and you have synchronized methods over in Java, um, synchronized keyword, synchronized keyword. You have a, a loop that's just waiting for some condition to be met. Um, in this particular case, they were asking for five conditions, making sure that they were met. But the code was not guaranteeing that um, um, all those conditions were like whenever any of those conditions changed that they actually went and unblocked this wait loop. And I was forking my uh, forking the code and actually adding more behaviors on top of it. So I ended up in this in this weird thing where I have locks in an already uh, in an application and to introduce my own behaviors, my own layers of abstractions, I had to put more locks in um, just so that I can continue uh interacting safely with 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 the apps and um ultimately uh because i had to keep on acquiring these locks um which you have to do in a front-end application because you've got a, a events coming in at any point in time that you can't you can um order you end up having to put more and more locks into your application and when we get to a camel and talking about the decision making for this this, was, this played a big part in um, why I decided to just sort of scrap some of the languages that I had known already and um, pick um, other languages. So I got a lesson out of that, which is avoid locks at all costs um, and uh, preferring uh, cooperative threading for Shadow. Okay, so I went, I, I got through those problems. I had an alpha launch of um, my um, of my heavily, heavily, heavily customized um, um, application um, chat app, and it solved the problems. But I was limping over to the to to the starting line there. And but at the end of the day, I had six months into it. I had a demo available. I can start collecting some feedback whether or not it worked. And from a startup perspective, because I was a startup at that particular point. Um, that's a great timeline. You're six months in, you got a product, you're starting to get feedback. That's a good thing. So everything started going rosy. And um, um, I had made sure that it was over on Google Play Store. Um, I was in their alpha testing, which is an invite only uh, kind of mode that they have. I'm getting some good feedback uh, in terms of what I, what I'd actually built. But that was just before I was about to release a public beta launch. And I did say I would set this out in Acts, and Act 2 was about to happen. So um, that was the seeds of conflict, and we're about to see where the real conflict is actually coming from. 
So act two, Google enters the picture and Google sends me an email on May 9th, 2021, <laughs> saying this is a notification that your Google Play publisher account has been terminated. Wow, this is not a, a lovely uh, thing to, to hear a Sunday night. And um, what they don't tell you is that I, they locked out the entire Google, Google Cloud account. So it wasn't just um, the play, the play, um, the play store, but um, all the, uh, the the databases and compute and whatever I had over in Google Cloud was completely locked out. And uh, they told me the reason, at least what they considered to be the reason, which is there's some violations of some agreements, and uh, they outlined it in some previous emails they sent. Um, just a, uh, the, the reality of it is they didn't send any previous emails. That's just a standard uh, form letter that they had sent. And yeah, they didn't give an explanation about why they terminated. So they gave a little bit of an out. Um, if, you've if you've reviewed the policy and feel this termination may have been an error, please reach out to one of our policy support teams. So obviously I'm gonna do that because it's really the only option available. And they make it clear that's the only option available because we will not be restoring your account at this time. So it's the only option that I had available. Um, so I did do that appeal. Sorry, I just want, before I move on to the next one. So just make note of the date. It's May 9th, 2021. I sent out an appeal. And uh, this is literally what I wrote. I didn't write anything else. I have every reason to believe that the app is in full compliance with the policies in the agreement, but I've received no indica uh, email indicating what the policy violation was. Instead, I received that thing that you just read. Um, however, I have not received any um, prior violations in any previous emails. And that was it, full stop. So, how long did I wait for a response? One month, exactly one month later. So May 9th is when I um, when they terminated. And then June 9th, they sent me a message back saying, hi, developers at Discov. It's just me at that point. Um, thanks for contacting. And then give some generic thing about due to, due to work schedules at this time, you may experience longer than usual processing times. This is a month, by the way. Um, and then after further review, we've accepted your appeal and reinstated your account. And at this point, I'm just like, what, 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 what is, what is happening here? Um, and they go on a little bit further, but the, the thing that I, I, I caught my eye a little bit was that towards the end, they were saying, kindly keep in mind that any new policy violations may result in your account's permanent uh, termination from Google Play. Um, I was definitely, definitely um, just overcome. They were so kind to me that uh, after 30 days, actually 31 days, um, they, uh, they, 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 um, they were, they were going to uh, permanently terminate my account. So I looked at that, and I had three things that I, that I was looking at. One, I've got no warning. Um, two, I had no explanation. And three. Um, I had my business inaccessible, the thing that I actually developed um, was inaccessible for a, a full month. And I was putting my name behind things um, that like, I would be um, uh, deploying products in the field, personal safety products. And safety is sort of the key word. I can't, I couldn't imagine myself actually doing that and putting my name behind something and then having it just taken off the market for a month uh, with no explanation. Um, so I just resolved at my point in time, just never again, this is never gonna happen. So I ended up with um, some requirements in my little heading here, enter OCaml. Camel's coming to this picture now. Um, when I'm writing a web application, uh, a mobile application, I need to make sure that I have some way of, way, uh, of which to easily switch over to a web application if a vendor ends up messing uh, with, what I'm, with, with what I'm doing. So that was sort of my central requirement. I needed that way to just quickly just come along and, and um, have a fallback in case something, uh, something like that happened over again. 
In addition, I had my own personal tech re technical requirements. Um, I wanted to make sure, and it was hard for me to characterize it at this, but um, if I was adding a new piece of code, like a new thread, it didn't have to come along and worry about its side effects on all the other code. Um, and I wanted to make sure that now, especially that I've spent so much time and then um, have it possibly taken off uh, off the market, that it was very quick for me to deploy the rest of my um, products over to where I wanted to go, embedded devices for computer vision, desktops, and iOS, which I had to deploy to at that point in time. And then last, because um, it was in the, I, I am in the personal safety space, I wanted to make sure that it was easy um, for at least the parts of the software that I was developing that I really needed to care about, that I could prove that it was actually safe. So those are my three sort of top requirements that I actually had in a, on top of making sure that I had a, a, um, a web backend um, that uh, could complement um, a mobile app. So let's just start with that first one, which was my never again requirement, um, just being able to switch. I'm over. sorry, can I jump in real quickly with a question? Yep, absolutely. Um, what, what are the, the personal safety applications that you're looking at developing? Um, my products? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I haven't released them yet. I'd love to actually talk about them when they're actually released. Um, okay. So, um, but um, yeah, I, I'll say the space in which I come from, computer vision, data and security. Um, I, I think you could probably get some picture of, of uh, what I'm doing in that space. Okay. Okay. Thank you. So, um, yeah. So, this was this actually particular requirement about being able to switch over to a web application um, was uh, went down a lot of the, the languages. Um, I ended up just really ranking um, some languages that naturally fit the bill. So JavaScript, obviously, it's it's if you if you're on a web application, you just use JavaScript. But you can also use JavaScript on the mobile apps and some other uh, domains as well. Um, at this time is when I actually figured out um, that OCaml was actually a really good option here for generating uh, JavaScript code. And last, which is um, just generating uh, WebAssembly from Rust and C. So there's more options in there, but those are the three top ones that, that sort of uh, appeared to me. So that drastically went down the field and I, I focused on those. And then I had my own personal requirements that, that, I, that I went through. So um, I focused just really on the cooperative threading and JavaScript and OCaml um, um, came up in the top there. Um, C obviously doesn't have that at all. Rust has some um, ability to do it. I had not written a line of Rust code, but I had done a little bit of research and it seemed at least from my outside perspective that it was going to be difficult to do a sync, um, single threaded attack IO. And um, my second requirement was to be able to deploy to a bunch of um, different uh, targets, embedded devices, desktops, and iOS and, and mobile. Um, but here it's kind of easy. Rust and C are sort of the, uh, the, the, the ones where that's uh, pretty easy to do. Um, and, um, um, I, 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 I was, I was really focused on, um, the, at least, at least for this part anyway, it's like, what is the things that would impact me in the short term? And what are the things that impact me in the long term? So I didn't really see any blockers for Rust and C. I saw obviously a big blocker with OCaml. I had to learn something I didn't, I didn't know anything about. And, um, JavaScript had its own blockers. It's basically because it, it's not sort of natural in all those environments in which I, 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 uh, I actually wanted to target. And then last, um, and this probably is showing you, I put OCaml way down at the bottom and you're gonna see why here, um, is how like the long-term um, um, impacts of choosing a particular language. Um, I didn't see very much friction with um, just keeping C. Um, the long-term sort of drag that I'd have with JavaScript is I'd have to worry about interrupt between JavaScript and whatever, um, um, like Swift or or uh, embedded um, sort of APIs you need to deal with. That was a drag. 
Um, also as well, Rust, um, again, I hadn't written a lot of code, but I just heard that um, it was harder to write uh, Rust um, over time um, relative to, to most other languages. And then there was this drag with OCaml, which is like, if I'm if I'm getting to a point where I'm starting to hiring people, uh, it would, I would have to deal with the fact that there's very little supply of OCaml engineers. So those are, that's how I ranked it out for, um, for OCaml. And um, just a, a slight little segue in terms of the, the Rust thing, um, I, th that sort of impression that I had from my research, which is just really looking at mailing lists and things of that sort. Um, there's actually a roadmap for Rust in that um, they talk about for, for next year. Um, the typical onboarding time for a Rust engineer is around three to six months. But even so, um, many people report using uh, having a high cognitive overhead using it and a learning curve. So I, I think I feel uh, like kind of vindicated a little bit that my research wasn't in vain there. Um, but it 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 it, it I, I'm not gonna like knock it. It has it has its uh it has its benefits. And then last, my last personal requirement was being able to prove the software that I developed is safe. Um, and the uh, OCaml okay, well, actually just came up pretty, bubbled up pretty top, uh, uh, quickly up to the top. I had not heard about Cock and some of the other tools that, that uh, OCaml okay, well, is very, um, um, whatever the word is, um, in harmony with. But um, yeah, so OCaml okay, well, bubbled up to the top. It was a GC language, so naturally it's ne memory safe. Rust obviously is memory safe as well in a different way. And additionally, it has resource safety, which is sort of an undersold thing uh, for Rust, I, I feel. Um, and then C's down over at the bottom. So I did, ended up doing my little framework and I had all of these different languages um, and um, um, considerations and nothing was really coming up to the, to the, to the forefront. Um, so what I did was sort of evaluated whether or not um, some of these things were soft requirements or hard. And this soft sort of thing here I ended up being was that OCaml, like the long-term drag on it, I can kind of mitigate that if I come along and make sure that it was easy to adopt uh, OCaml. I can mitigate part of that that uh, down down um, that downgrade on, on OCaml. So um, I'll skip through this just a little bit. Um, I ended up picking OCaml after I, I really made sure I prioritized my number one feature here, which is the web applications. I somewhat prioritized um, proving the safety of it. And after rejigging that, OCaml came to the top. Sort of the, the, the big thing I want to just call out here is it wasn't like a unanimous, this is a slam dunk. Um, I knew that I uh, picking OCaml would have its risks. I would actually have to incur some risks and making sure that I can have it easily adopted um, in my own company. So I had to deal with the low supply um, of OCamelers if my, from my own company's perspective and um, making it easy to adopt for people who um, were using my tools. Um, and last, uh, we sort of alluded to this, I knew there was, there was poor support for Windows, but my prior interaction with OCaml, which is this cool tool called Unison, uh, Unison, Unison File Sync, um, uh, I had compiled with OCaml doing that. I knew uh, support existed on Windows. So I knew there was a way out with that. So my strategy was um, a typical one, just get with the top risk first, which is Windows in the long-term thing. And um, um, while I'm spending my time uh, doing that development of those tools, well, at the end of it, go and release it um, and preferably fund um, some of the development work that, you, that, that I've done. So really sort of at the end of the day, I, the, the low supply and the Windows risk, since that was the top risk for me, it was pretty easy is I'm gonna come along and make sure that I can build OCaml projects for my own um, products um, on Windows easily. And my focus then was just on my own company because I knew I was gonna get some uh, employees in. And I also knew that I was gonna get some contractors in to do a particular part. So I wanted to make sure it was easy for my employees, which is kind of an easy thing. And for contractors, which is a little bit, actually quite a, quite a, quite a bit, um, a, a, a different um, level of difficulty. 
And so my end goal, my vision was they just be able to open up a project, run some Windows script to install an OCaml, edit um, the OCaml code if they needed to, and press build, and it would just work. That was sort of my end goal. And I got to that. Um, but again, my focus was employees and contractors. At this point in time, I had not released it to the public at all. And um, um, I went through several issues just getting to that point. I'm going to very quickly go through this. I, I'll leave some time at the end. But um, uh, my number one issue was uh, Visual Studio. Um, was like most of the libraries, third party libraries at Windows are for Visual Studio, OCaml. The predominant usage, if you were going to use uh, Windows, was GCC. And they're simply not compatible. People think they're compatible, but they're not. And um, uh, as an example, um, Libby UV, which is an inventing, a popular inventing library behind Node.js, um, has its own support matrix. Um, Windows is tier one. Um, so it's free as BSD, for example. But if you use the GCC, the MinGW stuff, it's tier three. And when they say tier three, they say these systems may inadvertently break. Um, it's community maintained. It's like really not a good position to be in if you're trying to build a, a, a product line. And then the second issue was Unix commands. Um, the, like Unix is just heavily embedded in much of the OCaml ecosystem. Um, you would see things like um, when you're when you're um, installing um, OCaml itself, like you can install packages with the package manager. You would have just implicit assumptions that there was a POSIX shell to go run a configure script, right? Like this was just littered throughout um, many of the packages. It's getting a, actually a little bit better, but um, this one in particular doesn't have it. So you needed to, if you're going to come along and run over on, on Windows, you have to bring some Unix shell along with it. And I ended up solving that um, by uh, providing a little proxy that, well, beyond just installing a Unix subsystem, msys2, over on, on, on Windows, um, just having a proxy so that if you ran, um, for example, OPAM, which is our OCaml package manager, um, really it was my little proxy script called with dkml.exe. And it would just look for the dash real, the real application um, in the same folder. And before it launched it, it would just put all the Unix binaries like the POSIX shell in the path. And it would just also put um, the Visual Studio um, environment variables uh, in the environment as well. So that solved actually both issues. And that's a, a kind of useful little trick. And um, I think that it sort of applies even outside of outside of OCaml itself. Um, you might be able to use this if you have these type of problems in your, your particular language that you have to like. Um, and then the last issue was the the maintainer, um, I think almost 10 years, um, there, there was somebody who was actually doing the GCC port of Windows, and they just and they said that they were going to stop using, um, stop supporting Windows. So I decided sort of at that point that, hey, I've, I've bet my, I have pot committed, um, and I know my Texas folks will understand what I just said there, um, I've pot committed. Um, myself over to OCaml, and I can't get Windows to, to die. So I'm going to come along in my own self-interest, go and release um, the scripts that I have for building on Windows, because I didn't want Windows to die. So I did that, and um, um, that was OK. I mean, some people started adopting it, but it wasn't very much. And then the OCaml Software uh, Foundation sort of uh, approached me and asked if I actually support it in, like a, in a meaningful way. So my existing support was, let's make sure it doesn't die. And um, they didn't say this directly, but I'm going to summarize it as, as um, they wanted it to be at a point where Windows is actually thriving on OCaml, um, on Windows. So people can contribute to it, and um, you can actually promote it as a real thing um, to, the, uh, to newcomers to OCaml. My, I had to make some decisions here about, um, um, like, what's going to be open source and what's not. Um, I ended up uh, breaking my sort of product strategy a little bit. And um, DKML, which is really the subject of this talk here, is um, just pure OCaml. Its purpose is to um, learn really quickly and develop one-off um, 
executables like what you'd normally use uh, uh, OKML for today. And all the build tooling would just be conformant with the OKML standards. Um, and then anything on the commercial side, the right-hand side, it would be more in the mixed environments. I, I, I knew I wanted C a lot in my, um, in my commercial stuff. And uh, I wanted bindings to Swift and Java so I can run on, on mobile. And so it wasn't just a development environment, it's development environment and libraries to help people like me who um, were really concerned about um, the risks of a vendor or a technology just disappearing you um, for whatever their particular reasons were. And um, just from a from a um, a tooling perspective, instead of using OCaml, it, it 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 would orient most of what it does around the C standard build tools. Um, and we'll see a little demo of that if we have a little bit of time. So I did agree to that. Um, and what the first project that sort sort of we worked out was a a uh, um, just download click uh, Windows installer. And I made sure that I, pour, uh, um, like my own development on, on Windows, I dog footed it. I caught a lot of bugs early. Um, and I, 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 I used um, the, the environment that that, that thing installed um, so I can do development over and on camera. And the biggest drawback of it is it's slow. It's still slow today. Um, a, two, a two CPU VM takes 90 minutes to go ahead and install um, from scratch. Um, and Mac OS, for example, I just timed this yesterday, um, takes 15 minutes. So you got a 6x multiple here. And it's not a fair comparison because I'm comparing uh, Apple Silicon versus like a two CPU um, PC. But even still, the Windows is just slower. And that's sort of the overhang of, um, of just um, first class support for Unix and second class support for Windows in, um, in OCaml, the broader ecosystem today. And Sort of the biggest advantages from my point of view, and very much aligned with my goals, is it's really that not very hard in which to go and install it and actually get running productive. So um, if you were doing it on Unix, and maybe this is normal for Unix, but it's definitely not for Windows users, um, you'd have to end up having five different commands. One of them would ask you a bunch of questions. You'd have to do a bunch of reading. Um, and uh, you'd have to deal with what we call OPAM, OPAM switches, which is, uh, if you're not familiar, it's very analogous to um, Python virtual environments. Now, as a big, like you need to have this stuff, but as a beginner coming into it, um, or just in my, in my, my world, um, a contractor coming in, they shouldn't have to learn that just to be able to, to use uh, your particular tool. So, um, it's literally, they just go to an installation page. They, they review just um, some, some uh, comments about what will happen during the installation. They click the installer, um, it downloads. Um, for now, anyways, the uh, Windows um, Defender is gonna show up saying, hey, this is an unusual file. Do I actually wanna continue, continue uh, running it? And Windows users are habituated to just ignore this and just continue on anyways. <laughs> and um, um, it goes and uh, just does its installation. One of the first things it does is um, you take it for granted on Unix that you have easy access to a compiler. You don't on, my, uh, on Windows. So yeah. pull in a Visual Studio installer. And um, that takes like 10 minutes just there. And then um, you have to do the same thing with Git. So you pull that in. And one of the little weird idiosyncrasies of OCaml, at least today, is you actually have to compile, um, recompile all of your code, including the compiler itself, if your directories, um, if you're, if you have a, if you don't have a non-standard, if you have a non-standard directory structure. So on Unix, you can place things in, in slash user slash bin. I can come along and go pre-compile my code and then um, copy that over to some other uh, a Unix machine. And as long as my password is exactly the same, all the tools will work. That doesn't fly in Windows because every single person has their own directory structure and their own usernames. And that's usually where things are installed. Um, so you have to go and spend a lot of time and just go and, and compile things. So this compiling is done at installation time. That's a big contributor to why it takes an hour and a half to go do the install. 
But at the end of the day, you don't have to do anything. Um, you just wait for it. Um, and when it's done, you can just close out of the uh, installer, go and uh, go to your start button, run um, the uh, command prompt, CMD, press enter, and then type another four letters um, to get into the OCaml interactive terminal and start your first um, OCaml expression. And that's it, right? So it's clicks, it's a few clicks, you wait, and then you can come along and have a fully functioning environment. And um, um, that's sort of uh, one of the first good, easy simplification deliverables that we that we, that we got with Windows. Um, I had a lot of issues with it. I think probably I'm gonna, just in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through many of them. One of the ones that is sort of endemic though, I'll just, I'll just focus on this one, is um, spaces in directories. Uh, that is still a problem today. It's just, I guess, I guess on Unix, you just, it's just rare um, that you have spaces in directories. It is extremely, extremely common, um, especially for people's usernames to be first name, space, last name. Um, and so many tools on the Unix side of the world break in, in, in that context. Um, Mac OS actually has spaces in, uh, in, in many things as well. So it's not, it's not an anomaly. Um, okay, so now into Act 3. So that was delivered, um, a nice simplification. It was long, but it was a, it was a, it was a, it's, a, it's a much easier install experience for, for Windows and beginners are able to just immediately uh, go and start OCamaling okay um, 90 minutes after they, they click that install. So I'm just gonna give you a little status of where things are right now. Um, the, um, um, the the biggest missing feature is um, being able to have a version of that installed. It doesn't require a C compiler. One of the nice little things about o uh, OCaml is not only does it target your native code, but you can just have it run bytecode as well without having a C compiler. Um, it's it's um, so you can have a really really small um, um, experience as long as you as long as you don't pull in C code. Um, so yeah, that would that would be great for students and beginners just to quickly go and uh, use OCaml. Um, the other parts is just basically delaying as much as possible any virtual environment, the switch. Um, like you do need it to install packages, but if I install more packages up in sort of the main global area, um, um, our new users won't have to. Uh, um, they can delay um, installing. Um, their own virtual environment. And then OCaml itself. OCaml sort of had a big change uh, in the last year or so. so they released uh, multi-core OCaml, OCaml 5. Um, it's not ready for Windows right now. Um, there is a variant of it out for GCC. I don't know how well supported it is right now, but there's not really going to be full support for um, OCaml 5 um, on Windows for at least a year. And I've don't really have any involvement with it. I just need to, to wait for um, the compiler pieces to uh, be ready for that. Um, today, right now, the Dub distribution, that's my company, the distribution of Windows that I have is the recommended way of installing it on Windows. But um, I have been upstreaming a whole bunch of my um, changes in Windows over to the package manager and the OPAM teams have been really good about adopting them. and um, adding a whole bunch of other features as well. So the next major release of OPAM um, should be like the recommended way in which to actually install some Windows. And I love that idea because then I'm not on the hook for all Windows users forever. Um, and uh, I'm gonna, I'm gonna kind of just skip here to sort of the things that just aren't gonna fly. I just don't think they're gonna be really fixable. And there are many packages and people who are just familiar with makefiles. And makefiles just, they kind of work and they don't work if you have any full pass in them that have spaces. And there's nothing that's really gonna fix makefiles in that sense. So as long as people use them, um, there, there's, there's um, limited ability for it to work correctly on Windows. And probably more, more pernicious is OCaml's really good integration with C, but the way that we predominantly do it in OCaml is using uh, package config. Um, package config has the exact same problems. Um, it can't support spaces, or at least it supports it very poorly. And um, 
um, worse about it is there's no Windows package config. Um, so um, yeah, so that's just going to be sort of a drag on Windows um, until those are resolved. And I actually don't see a good path out for either of those two. Um, but at the end of the day, I still find it it's it's um, quite reasonable to actually go and develop. I develop myself on Windows. I develop for Windows. Um, I also develop on other machines as well. So I've got a routine where I come along and spend a week over on Mac OS and then switch back to a week over on, on, on Windows. I, I do that because it's really hard to context switch with your your key bindings <laughs> um, when you go from Mac to Wet to Windows, so it just it helps me out, and um, I just want to make sure there's no bit rot between the two. But I'm actually developing OCaml using the the OCaml tools that are releasing. I'm dog footing, and um, the commercial um, I think tools that I'm building, I'm developing my chat. I'm developing, and um, I'm just like briefly going to talk about that right now. So. The commercial tools that I, I've, I've um, been developing, it's development environment in libraries so that you can um, de-risk your, your technology and vendors. Um, and I'll explain that just in, 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 in briefly. So like myself, I'm building a chat app. It's gonna be a real chat app that that um, gets deployed. It's gonna be a mobile app that has a back end to it. I need to have it, um, but since it's um, like, there's a zillion and a half chats out there, um, I'm just going to release it. I'm not. Uh, it, it, it's it's it source code when it's when it's actually ready. So you'll actually be able to see it. It's going to be a good demo of the uh, the SDK that I'm building. And um, chats, uh, chat apps. It's it's actually kind of normal. Like WhatsApp sort of made uh, made it popular is to use actors, uh, the actor framework, um, uh, just basically distributed objects um, as a way to build your 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 chat your your chat backend. And um, right now I don't really think I need to have the uh, the 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 the, the, um, the actor sort of the bigger actor frameworks. Um, Erlang OTP is the big one and then ACA for for Java is uh, the other alternative. But I might need it. But um, I don't think I actually have to make that choice right now. I, I'm coding in a way that that I don't have to make that choice. And people who adopt my SDK don't have to make that choice either. So I shouldn't have to essentially commit to one of these vendors, Erlang or ACA, so early in terms of my um, product place. I don't need the complexity right now. Um, but I don't want to come along and build a whole bunch of code and then realize, oh, well, I can't scale or something of that sort. And um, I can't adopt any of these people later on. And um, the SDK and OCaml actually um, provide enough power for me not to be able to do that. So, um, so yeah, I'm not adopting those. I am using things that I'm comfortable with. I, I, I did spend a long time, 20 years of my life, working with a lot of data and a lot of transactions. Um, I spent, um, so I'm quite familiar with how to build um, large, high TPS kind of systems on top of distributed memory. And uh, Redis is sort of the canonical thing that you, you, you do outside of a particular company. So um, I'm building uh, part of my actor framework um, on top of Redis. And I my, my, my guess is that um, other people are gonna actually find Redis sort of a, a familiar thing, much more than um, Erlang or Akka. Um, they're gonna they're they're gonna probably have more familiar with Redis than they are with either of those two, and they may not, they may be in the same situation as me where I don't need to have all that reliability and and uh, um, deployment guarantees that come with some of the the more complex frameworks. Um, I'm actually just gonna show a little bit of of the the IDE experience. Um, it is just taken from um, the ACA sort of page. And it, it's, it's got a hello world with three actors in it. And uh, let's see, where are we here? So this is C-Lion. Um, Redis is a C-based, obviously it's a C-based uh, program. That's not obvious, but it's a C-based program. So I'm using a C, uh, a C IDE for it. Um, I am not going to go explore the code that much. I am just going to come along and make sure 
that I've got a whole a whole bunch of run targets that are available to me through um, C and OCaml. Um, in this particular case, I am running a pure C program called uh, Actor CLI, and um, I'm using the IDE just to do a bunch of printing of uh, messages um, back and forth. Hello world, uh, greetings. The exact same thing that you see over in here. Um, nothing particularly complicated about that. Um, I'm using lightweight threading um, to go and, and uh, do that over in OCaml. And that doesn't even use Redis. I just wanted to make sure that um, the, the OCaml experience was sort of easy. Um, and that lines up with what you do over with ACA. You get the same output um, slightly. It's ordered different, but um, it's the same output. And I guess the real important point is like I'm not tied to C-Line. I can come along and use another IDE. And in this particular case, I'm on Windows. I can go switch over to um, Visual Studio. Whoa, what just happened here? Oh, okay. Um, and um, oh, I get out of the way here. Um, I've got all my CMake targets available with the CMake plugin over in Visual Studio, and I can go and run it. Um, just the same thing I was doing over in C Lion, and I need to make sure that that I actually have some options here to I can see the output. And same output, same program, um, same source code, um, just running OCaml program through a different IDE. And I'm, I'm really trying to make a, a meta point here, which is it doesn't matter what your IDE is, your IDE supports CMake, then this thing will work. Um, this SDK will work. And um, um, so th there are the, the, big, the big IDE, so um, Visual Studio, Xcode, I already talked about C Lion, Visual Studio Code. Um, I'm maybe missing ones, uh, ones in there, but um, they all support uh, CMake as sort of a first class target. So as long as you support CMake, you support all of those uh, particular IDs. And um, a build tool is not very good unless it can actually target things. So I can, um, I have a, um, I'm using GitLab right now for doing um, continuous integration. Could be Git, uh, GitHub, and I'm targeting Android, Android 32 bit, Android 64 bit, um, the ARM variants and the Intel variants, targeting um, 32 bit uh, and 64 bit Linux, targeting um, in this particular case, because I'm on a GitLab, um, uh, Intel uh, Mac OS, and cross compiling the Intel Mac OS to uh, the um, ARM64 variant of it. So that's a cross compile. And then obviously let's talk about Windows, 32-bit Windows and 64-bit Windows. And like, it does the same things. Um, if I go look at the output, it actually runs in that particular, um, the exact same thing, hello world. So in this case, it's the OCaml, OCaml um, code that's running. Uh, after it generated a um, Windows executable. So just, just um, um, yeah, so the, the SDK lets you target all of those things and it lets you use the IDs that you're familiar with to go in, go ahead and do that. Um, and um, it lets you do it for OCaml and obviously it lets you do it for C as well. And I guess the, the, nice, the nice thing that I happen to like about it is it lets you combine those two things as well. So um, in my particular case, um, um, you can come along and go to a contractor and they're, they're just familiar with Swift UI or they're just familiar with uh, doing a Android Jetpack uh, kind of application. They can copy some uh, lines of code in and press build in their IDE and um, um, your OCaml um, interfaces are going to be available for them. Um, Assuming you have a binding uh, between the languages. Um, and uh, if they need to edit something, for example, they're doing a UI, they see they, they, they see the need to have a new field on something populated in their back end, um, they can just go and copy and paste some of your code. They may not understand OCaml, um, but they can probably understand how to copy and paste code 
so they can copy and paste code and press build and it's available for them over in their in their front end um so that sort of gets around the whole like well i've got a whole limited pool of people who can actually do a camel and i can actually come along and go and scale through people who happen to not know the particular language in question um so uh just uh i think people it's probably pretty obvious the, the type of people who would who would be gravitating towards this um basically anyone who needs tech resources and they don't um have the expertise in-house to be able to go and do it um so startups is the classic one and um if you're a service organization you service other people um you're probably in the same boat so if you want to go visit um my homepage uh discub.com and there's documentation available to it right now i'm actually releasing it publicly um next monday so five days from now, six days, five days it is. And um, it'll have more complete docs, but the docs are available for you to, to look at right now. So that's it for um, um, the OCaml, um, like how I actually use OCaml on my, my machines. Um, and uh, sort of one of the interesting areas, and I'm gonna conclude with this topic is, um, is hiring. Um, one of the interesting areas that I I've sort of had to deal with is like, actually, what am I going to do for my hires? So I ended up um, having my first time, um, my first uh, full time engineer who's, who's going to be coming over in the summer. Um, I had a choice between because I'm very C centric or camo centric um, a choice between choosing that I chose to uh, bring in somebody with a C background and a teaching background, by the way, but um, a C background and um, um, I, I, I'm going to delay actually getting my camel expert in until full-time employee two or three. That's just the way that I've, I've strategized this. And, um, but I've taken on the risk of, um, doing, um, actually taking in high school students as trainees. And, uh, I know, uh, Black had, uh, had talked about, uh, Teal. So hopefully, uh, this is up, up, uh, um, sort of in the same vein as that as well. So. What I uh, I had two purposes with this. Um, one is I wanted to well just get some more people available to actually work on some of the OCaml stuff. I'd work on the harder stuff and leave some of the the uh, the less hard stuff over to um, people that I train. But I had a second purpose, and this is a really important one, which is I wanted to come along and demonstrate that and prove to myself, but to prove to others that um if you took the risk of having a camel in your in your um in your team in your company whatever it was um that it wasn't going to break your team they wouldn't come along and and uh be overwhelmed with that particular choice it's not gonna you're not gonna have people leave because it's just too hard to do or it takes too long to come along and go go and learn so my sort of study if we want to call it that is i have high school students um who have taken in i've trained they have apcs um a java background um i have trained most of them for approximately 150 hours that's been less it hasn't gotten to all the for um all of them um up to 150 hours and um um i guess my my sort of my my, my, my stake is if I can come along and train them in that period of time, in a quantified period of time, um, your team can too. So that's sort of how I come along and, and look at um, 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 dealing with the common objection, which is, uh, I'm, I don't know this language and it's gonna come along and, and, uh, and kill my team. So um, that justified the risk of actually putting on, um, uh, getting on high school trainees. And I had obviously had to change my expectations. They weren't college interns. College uh, interns, you know, they're committed for a period of time. Um, high school interns, absolutely not. Um, they have far, far less time right now. Most of the people who I'm working with, um, like for the past few weeks, have had zero hours. Um, so um, because midterms, or for example, or, or finals actually coming up um, in a month from now. And um, so, it is it is, uh time is not in your control um and also college interns you end up doing very large projects you have no experience with high school um even if you've taken a, a computer science class of actually doing a large project so you're going to have to help them initially 
during the breakdown of tasks. And um, they may not come back over during summer because that's not a uh, typical expectation that you get with high school students. Um, I did, um, oh, I just wanna give one little caution and this is really important. I am talking about minors. Uh, I'm not, so because I'm talking about minors, I am not gonna be giving particular specifics about why people chose to do X, Y, and Z. Just hopefully you can understand that situation. Um, but I can at least give some summary broad level things. So, Yes, they were trained for 150 hours. Some of them came in in a path where they wanted to be entered. Some of them came in in a path where um, it was best for them to be um, end up in a path where they can do code contribution. So basically do um, a project. Um, that's sort of what their goals were. So um, everyone came in with their own course load and the extracurricular. So not everyone trained at the same rate. Um, and my outcome, of that 150 hours was get to a point where I can come along and say, I give you a task and you come along and write, you know, 20, 40 lines of code um, in an hour, you do it correctly. Um, and I have given you five minutes of structures. I can scale with that, right? Um, and um, so five minutes, I give instruction an hour, they come along and go and do it correctly. And um, if they're coming in, in the summer where they have a lot of time, um, we can start off sort of essentially kind of doing light pair programming that way for a few weeks, and then they can graduate themselves to five minutes as a stand up every single day, doing eight hours, not one hour, right? So that's sort of that's sort of the goal there. Um, so that was sort of the, the reset uh, expectations for high school hiring, and that was the way I actually trained them. Most of them, okay, let me just give you the results of it. So. Um, only one of them has uh, actually been able to commit all the 150 hours, and I did an assessment with them, and uh, they passed, and uh, they're getting a summer off. The other um, three haven't been able to commit all the time, but we have a month or two before um, summer comes around, and I'm very, very confident that most, if not all of them, are actually going to be able to pass that final test because I've done tests with them before. Um, so I'm going to be having in the summer um, a couple of people doing return internships and a couple of people doing their own projects. And uh, yeah, from, from my perspective, it's an absolute huge success. Um, I'm going to be able to bring people in that are productive. I know what kind of expectation I have with them. And uh, yeah, um, so I'm going to sort of end off on that um, um, and just wrap everything up right now. So uh, some key takeaways I just wanted to leave out there and I'll open up for questions. Um, I know I kind of briefly went over this, but if you're actually supporting Windows as a first class thing, there's just some concepts that you're just going to have to take care of. One, one of the, the more, most important ones is actually you use Visual Studio and you don't use GCC. Um, I didn't actually have room in here to put it, but spaces as well is, is a huge thing. Um, you can reuse if you want, just come talk to me offline about using um, um, the proxy that I built, uh, maybe rejiggering it if you have a favorite language that is very Unix heavy and you want to port it over to Windows. Um, and um, OPAM itself, which is the OCaml package manager, but it's actually very language agnostic. So that's a really good tool if you, you don't, you want to kind of improve your package management experience. Um, Talk to me as well about training and hiring high schoolers. Um, it's it's different, but I think it's probably the best way to prove that if you say that you know other people can come along and adopt your particular technology, and you actually have high schoolers demonstrate that they can actually do it, that there's nothing better than that. So uh, come talk to me if you want to go and do that. And finally, um, if you're sort of in my my own situation where you're really concerned about um, being able to stuck on um, uh, vendors or um, particular technologies that you may think are going out of fashion, um, consider using DKFDK to solve your problems and just go to my homepage for that. So thank you and I'm gonna open up the, uh, the floor for questions. All right, thank you so much. All right. Um, Thank you very much. For questions, I've got a few, but go ahead. Can I just ask? So I know you mentioned that you weren't going to talk about the uh, dealing with the the make and um, you know the the package uh, 
package get for, for, for whatever for uh, for Linux how it doesn't really work well for Windows. I mean, yeah, is there, are there any ideas for so is is Opum sort of the way around that or is it? No, it um, no, it's not. So the the problem is not so much the OCaml side; it's the C side, right? Like if sure. um, if if you're on Unix, the standard way in which you come along and you link with with uh, or just find your libraries on on, on Unix is using package config. Um, there is not a cross-platform way in which to do that unless you're using um, like CMake or something of that sort um, that has its own mechanisms for 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 building and, and, and discovering things. So that's one of the reasons why I think this is actually going to be almost impossible to dislodge. Um, the only way I really consider uh, seriously see that being dislodged is if you have an alternative to package fake and fake <laughs> that Unix users can actually use to actually replace package and fake. And you'd have to get C users to actually like Unix users and C users to actually adopt it. Um, that's a tall task. Um, um, and uh, I don't have the motivation to go and drive that. Um, but if someone does, then great, that, that would actually solve the problem. Sure. I guess I was thinking, I don't know. Um, so WinGet, is is uh, is this available on WinGet or is it something that's... So, um, okay, that, that's a random aside, but um, yes, you yeah, can actually sorry. install both OPAM and... Um, uh, okay, I haven't announced that, but I will announce it now. So OPAM Package Manager is um, available. You can just type winget install OPAM and um, it will um, install OPAM on Windows. Um, by itself though, OPAM is not that useful because you need to have uh, Unix environment stuff with it, which is the reason why I haven't announced it. Um, and then you can also install all of the the uh, uh, the DKML distribution with winget install, I think it's like a DKML. Um, and it'll do that whole um, installer process um, that you you saw me um, sort of demo um, early in, in in the talk. But um, none of that sort of, I, I feel like that's kind of very orthogonal to to the package get thing. So the, sure. the package config thing. So I'm just trying to think of a, a good example. Um, you are trying to pull in, let's just say the open SSL libraries, right? Um, and uh, you need to have a way in which to access to find that library wherever it happens to be on Windows and wherever it happens to be on Unix. And Unix, is, it, it may not be in a particularly standard location, but you can at least use package config to go figure it out. On Windows, there's no real story for that, right? And that's why I'm sort of saying, like, even if you wouldn't get it, your open SSL, Winget doesn't have any metadata uh, for you to query to go see where it installed things. <laughs> um, or like here's the standard include path or, or something of that sort. If it did, actually that would be a that would actually be useful. Awesome. I'm glad it's on Winget. I will probably download it tonight. <laughs> Um, is there, so uh, Visual Studio Code has a, uh, a feature where you can run your code and do your compiling, all of that in within the uh, Linux uh, VM, the WSL. Yep, yep. Uh, is, there, is there a reason why you want to build on, on the Windows side versus like in the WSL environment? Um. Okay, so I, I do use that. I, I think I was using it last week um, to test out some some Unix, uh, some Linux stuff. Um, the real problem is that you are building Linux binaries when you're doing that. Um, if ultimately what you're trying to do is distribute Windows binaries to people, um, you end up, you actually have to compile Windows um, to do that. Um, so um, I, like WSL2 is, a really like nice thing. I just don't think it it um, it solves the need for for Windows users who are actually building Windows things. Actually, completely doesn't. Um, the other thing that I found is using WSL two. Um, I cannot remember what I was compiling. 
um, last week, but um, I did find that it is so atrociously slow um, when it comes to uh, compiling things. Um, for normal operations, like if you're going to throw up a web browser and like, as long as you don't have heavy file, although you're fine. Um, and um, if you are, you are completely fine if um, you are in a fully Linux volume, um, like you're not on, on any Windows mount. But the reality of the world, at least the, my world anyways, is I need to access Windows files. Um, and the second you do that, you're, it's just, it is literally 20, 30 times slower. Um, it's, it's just not worth it and that, that point. So, uh, and it's, it's probably a matter of me uh, having lived too long in the enterprise uh, space where the only building you're doing on, on, a, on, a, on your own machine is like for your testing, uh, but any release builds happen somewhere else. Like it, you know, they happen on a on a on a server somewhere. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, so, so I, I, that's that's a really key what you're what you're saying here. So, if if what you are doing is targeting servers, then you don't need Windows. Like I would, like I was talking about Redis, for example. Um, I. Um, I would never deploy, and I'm, I'm sorry if you, you, you people want to do this, but I would never deploy Redis on, on Windows. I'm going to deploy it on Linux. Um, and uh, it's, it's just, I'm going to use Linux and or some kind of Unix thing for deploying on my service. And if that's all you want to do, then don't use Windows for that. Um, but um, um, for, for deployment aspect, the only part that I would say, though, that that doesn't make as much sense as when you're trying to debug things. Um, in like, even in my Redis thing, like I made sure that I had a windows, uh, I made a windows build of Redis and I'm debugging in, um, windows because even if, for example, windows studio code has a nice integration with WSL two and it kind of works, um, when it comes to debugging over on windows, I want to use, um, either visual studio itself for debugging or better yet use when debug and, and, um, or when debug preview, whatever the, uh, the, 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 the next version of that is. And, um, those don't support it. Right. Um, so I don't want to be limited in my options simply because, um, um, my final environment is going to be, um, Unix, right. I'd rather have all of my development, um, um, on windows if I can. Only if I can, um, and then make sure, and then deploy that over to a, a Unix environment. That's 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 the way I, I feel about it. I, uh, other people have different takes. Uh, that makes perfect sense. Um, one question I had: um, since Windows is so important, um, why not F sharp? Well, we got a bunch of F sharp people in the room here. F sharp. <laughs> 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 it's part of the it's part of the old camel family, right? I mean, it's, like, it's, like, you know. it's iron camel, right? Sort of. <laughs> yeah. To be honest, um, actually, it's, it's it's actually interesting because um, I'm not sure why I oh oh I I know the reason why I, I didn't put F sharp high up on my list um just to begin with like I I did know about it I did evaluate it for my particular reasons um, since I knew that I was targeting um both mobile and embedded devices the embedded devices in particular like i didn't see a very good path for f sharp slash dot net kind of on embedded now it might work i don't know i just i didn't see a happy path for that um i am the one of the things i i kind of look at when it comes to a camel itself is i don't really see a camel as a camel i see it as sort of like a, a layer on top of c like I can compile a camel. I can do it from scratch using C. I can almost do that anywhere, right? Like I, I felt comfortable enough, and I only just started using a camel two years ago, um, contributing um, um, some patches to get um, um, a camel working on uh, Android ARM 32. Um, there's, there's, I mean, it had ARM 32 already, but like some more support for that. That. Um, um, that I didn't have. I felt comfortable not doing it because it's just like C code <laughs> and some assembly. Like it, it's so close to C that like it, I don't have a problem when it comes to the embedded world. I didn't get that story from F sharp. 
Now, that is my particular needs. Now, if you're not in a, like if you are, if you are targeting just the front end or just the back end and you know where you're going, I think F sharp should be a really compelling option. And I'm sure people in the in the room who are using F sharp are probably in that category where it makes a ton of sense. Yeah. Other questions? Other questions? All right. Well, I'm gonna thank you. I'm gonna turn off the recording and then we can see if we have other. Offline, <laughs> non recorded questions and discussions. So I want to thank you very much. Um, this is great, really interesting. Thank you.